is Anuradha Mittal, who's the Executive Director of the Oakland Institute in the United States. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity to present Oakland Institute's work around uh, militarization and land grabs in Sri Lanka. Um, I will be sharing here the findings of our research including extensive field research in the northern and eastern provinces of Sri Lanka, as well as it's based on ongoing communication with the local communities, especially the internally displaced populations in the country. The goal of our research was to understand the social, economic, and political reality in the northern and eastern provinces after the conclusion of the civil war in 2009. Our research led to the first independent in-depth report on post-war Sri Lanka, which was released in 2015, The Long Shadow of War, and it was released with a, another report, um, I Speak Without Fear, Where Are Our Loved Ones. Recently, we released Waiting to Return Home, the continued plight of the IDPs in Sri Lanka. Uh, if there's interest in any of these reports, please see me after a session. So, just some of the uh, key findings uh, which are related to our session today. One of the biggest consequences of the war was the displacement of people from their homes and lands that they depended on for their livelihoods. Along with indiscriminate killings that happened, it remains a highly contentious issue between the local Tamil population and the Sri Lankan army. Forced to vacate their homes, farmlands, and fishing zones once areas were designated as high security uh, zone or restricted zone, uh, the displaced hope that the right to return would be granted someday, but continued military occupation has kept tens of thousands away from their homes and livelihoods. Those who have been resettled through government schemes, the process has often taken place without voluntary or fully informed settlement choice and without adequate infrastructure in place for rebuilding their lives. Our recent report, Waiting to Return Home, reported on those displaced from Sampur who have been sent back to live in the shadow of the new Navy camp in Sampur, which has been built close to the old camp, and paddy land, which used to be owned by people. Having a Navy camp so close to the village is a major security concern for the locals who have faced harassment and abuse at the hands of the Sri Lankan army over the years. The new naval camp has also restricted these villagers' access to the sea and to the ponds, thus impacting their ability to continue fishing their traditional livelihood. The Navy has also converted a Hindu temple into a Buddhist one in the same area. People are being asked to resettle when there is no infrastructure available, including toilet. There's not a single toilet for the people who are being forced to go back and live next to the Navy camp. Seven years, seven years after the end of the war, the North and the East are still under very heavy military occupation, with an estimated one army personnel for every six civilians. The army has expanded, as was explained here, non-military activities and is engaged in large-scale property development, construction projects, and other business ventures, such as travel agencies, farming, holiday resorts. Thalsevna Resort is a seven-star um, holiday resort, which you and I can get on the website and uh, directly calling the Sri Lankan army can book a hotel and can go in. The chief minister of the northern province cannot visit Thalsevna, though it's in his province. These resorts and businesses are located on lands that were previously home to the local Tamil population. They see no signs of return despite numerous demands and petitions. These land grabs perpetuate and build upon decades-long history of marginalization of the Tamil population, which has involved violence, pogroms, repressive laws, and a government-orchestrated colonization of the northern and eastern parts of the island nation. In the decades following independence in 1948, the takeover of land and displacement started via so-called development schemes, uh, irrigation schemes, which colonized the Tamil lands through the settlement of hundreds of thousands of Sinhalese brought from the southern part of the country. The demographics of the eastern province have today changed. That was the intention of the government. It is no longer majority Tamil uh, with the uh, movement of the Sinhalese population from the south to the east. The same attempt is being made in the north. Post-war takeover of lands has continued for tourism and industry, allegedly for development activities to create livelihoods for the local population, but with complete disregard for legitimate residential and livelihood concerns. Pasikuda Hotel project in Batikaloa is only one such example where land initially taken over by the government during the war was subsequently included in the Pasikuda tourist zone by the Tourism Development Authority in 2012. 
Another emblem of the sinhalization of the North and the East that we are research team witnessed are numerous victory memorials, often with plaques only in English and Sinhali. These are in Tamil lands, and there's nothing in Tamil. In uh, Pudumathalan, in Malatibu, war hero memorial in Kokawil, <coughs> victory war memorial in Kilinochi, Kilinochi water tower, the terrorist bulldozer at the Elephant Pass, and the war hero memorial close to the Jaffna Lagoon. All these mo mo monuments at iconic locations send a strong message of the complete Sinhalese, Sinhalese takeover of Tamil land. The Sri Lankan army maintains these monuments visited by Sinhalese tourists and runs the chaos that sells snacks and soft drinks. Construction of Buddhist temples, the erection of Buddha statues in places where there are no Buddhist and designation as archaeological sites has become another source of land grabbing. Security Force Headquarters, Kilinochi, supported the construction of the Pagoda Manakulam Shri Sugata Vihar in Kilinochi in the Bani region, claiming it to be a place of Buddhist worship with a long history, which it does not actually have. The Seven Hot Springs of Kanya, the site of an ancient Hindu Shiva temple, today is home to a new Buddha statue, <coughs> maintained by a Buddhist monk. The army is deployed for security purposes. Renovation of the Hindu temple by the local community has been prohibited, citing Kanya as an archaeological site. In Kaladi, which borders Bhattikaloa, 78 acres were seized by a Buddhist monk who built a Vihar, a Buddhist temple, on the site of a former preschool, which catered to the needs of the Tamil population. There are numerous uh, similar reports of land seizures elsewhere, which has been documented by the Oakland Institute in our reports and also now by British Tamil Forum. The most distressing thing is what I'm going to share with you now. In early 2016, I was personally petitioned by a group of internally displaced people requesting assistance in their struggle to return home. They wrote, having exhausted all the domestic, political, and legal avenues available to us to regain our lands and houses acquired by force by the Sri Lankan armed forces during the war, we, the people of Valakam North, in Jaffna district of Sri Lanka, have decided to seek your help to find redress to our problem. After 25 years of displacement, having exhausted all possible political and legal channels in an attempt to get their land back, the internally displaced citizens who have been refugees in their own country, living in welfare camps, were forced to petition an international civil society group to seek assistance. They urged us not to publish the names of the signatories because they feared retaliation for contacting an international organization. And they reported, we get calls from unnamed, uh, unidentified telephone numbers from people who threaten us to stop the work around uh, settlement of the IDPs. International experts and organizations have called for the demilitarization of the North and East and the swift return of land to its rightful owners to ensure peace and stability. Despite the rhetoric of truth, justice, reconciliation, the current government does not plan to scale down military presence in the North. Over and over again, Sirisena's administration has come out blatantly saying that they would not be removing military presence from the North and East. Amid United Nations resolutions, various task forces, numerous government promises, tens of thousands of people continue to live in despair. Over a year and a half after the election of President Sirisena, tens of thousands continue to live in welfare camps, in IDP camps, refugee camps abroad, in my own country, India, or with relatives waiting to return home. Despite promises that have been made by President Sirisena, we know that no court and no inquiry has been lodged. Despite promises of resettlement, lands being released, no such lands that actually belong to the people originally are being released because they are being used for holiday resorts and other activities. Given the events of the past year and a half, it is vital that international community ensures that these processes occur. International leaders from the United States and United Kingdom must make it clear that instead of their narrow geostrategic interests, they care about human rights. That an independent international process must be struck, that returning land to its rightful owners to allow the displaced to build their lives again and livelihoods is imperative for sustainable peace and justice. After almost three decades of displacement, it is really time for peace in Sri Lanka. It is really time for all communities to have political, social, and economic inclusion. And it is important for a secular democratic country to emerge where there can be peace and stability. 